Oh, do we have, we have people joining right now. So we'll wait just a couple minutes, I think, and um, allow everyone to get logged on here. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started now. I don't see the number ticking up too rapidly anymore. I'm Molly Oblinger. I'm the director of the Castiger Gallery here at Ripon College, and I'm so pleased to have Njiwa Orma here with us tonight. I first need to thank the Castiger Fund for supporting our shows this year. For our students, particularly Cameron, Allie, and Caroline, who helped with the installation and preparing the gallery. And I also wanna give a big thank you to the college's marketing department who helped promote the show with press releases, posters, and you'll see um, a bit of a virtual exhibit on our website. So tonight we'll have a conversation that will be similar in length to our, to our artist talks um, that we've traditionally done. So we'll talk for about 20 minutes to Mijua Ormo. And I have a few questions that I'll get us started with, but I'd invite you, especially the students that are joining us live, to put some questions into the Q&A or the chat for us to look at tonight. So let me introduce Mijua Ormo who I'm so thrilled to have exhibiting at the Castiger. She was born and raised in Tokyo, Japan. And after receiving her degree in literature and graphic design in Japan, she emigrated to the US in the 1980s. She's received numerous um, awards and fellowships, including residencies at the Headlands Art Center and at Spaces Galleries, Spaces World Artist Project. She has exhibited extensively, including at the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, DC, the San Bernardino Art Museum in California, Ipex Art in New York City, and numerous other venues in Ohio. So again, if you have questions as we go, please put them into the chat. Mitchell, I became uh, acquainted with your work first when I saw an exhibition at the Weston Gallery in the Aronoff Center for the Arts <laughs> in Cincinnati. And I was struck by the emotion I felt viewing the works um, that, that drew on historical documents but that often contains no readable text or recognizable imagery. Can you talk about the ways that you use language, documents, and redaction in your work? Yeah. Um, first, I, I think my relationship to language, uh, being an immigrant, and I think a lot of of you who learn a second language can identify when you learn new language um, the language sort of a, is somewhat abstract and then you sort of get a lot more nuance from the language than just a uh, meaning for example if there's a pose between the talk that be potent or if somebody's just 
showing off and rapidly speaking the language that you just you just don't quite know it becomes it blinds you so i realized that as sort of that experience uh became a, a kind of a point of entry and and to sort of a, my relationship to language remains even though i speak okay english now um remain to be able to be a a kind of an interesting space that it's um you know we constantly try to get i kind of decided to stay in the kind of abstract space and explore that um the other thing is that there's a quote that i always kept close to me it says in hiding you show yourself and in showing you hide yourself and that sort of a again sort of a showing and hiding uh is very similar to my experience with language and that became my point of entry to sort of see what's there in between the showing and hiding and that invisible visible through my work Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna show, uh, or share rather, the screen as I talk about this next piece. Forgive me everyone, I, I can't seem to, um, I can't seem to talk and operate the computer at the same time. <laughs> So uh, there are works in many different media in the show, but when we were installing the exhibit, one of the student workers, Caroline, was looking closely at these pages that I'm sharing an image of now as she was hanging them. And she noticed the relationship between text and imagery. Can you talk about the role that materials and material selection play in your work? Yes, um, so I, through my work, I use many different kinds of materials and I deploy the sort of a material strategy for, depends on the what topic that I'm uh, creating, uh, exploring. For this particular work is that I visited 160 plus site of a ICE detention center that was currently operating in 2019. And I had the idea of creating the footprints of each site by going to visit through the Google map and looking at it from a bird's eye view and looking at the building, uh, looking around the street view and looking at the building from the street. But uh, I had this idea, but on what paper should I do? one could just choosing copy paper i can use it for you know i can use the drawing paper but it just did not feel right to me and i kept looking for what if it's a book what kind of book is a right match to this and i found in my bookshelf that it was given by my friend uh, a while ago is a dictionary of the underworld and dictionary is uh, a list of words and the words don't really function anything there to be used, waiting to be used. And it really depends on the person who picked the words, connect the words to a concept. And um, so it's not only that words are just for expression, but it's shaping the thoughts and concepts. And when I saw this dictionary and look at those words, I felt like uh, this, is, this is the right book or pages to put this detention center on and really uh, speak about the racism that it's uh, language sort of a cultivate and uh, the, the current situation of detention center. I just wanted to present in this way. Great, thank you. And language um, factors into a large number of your works. I wonder if you could 
talk a little bit about language and um, also the, the story that you shared with me that relates to um, the piece Signal, Morris Codes about the French knots and the, the history there. I'll share that image with everyone. Mm -hmm. now. Um, there's a piece, it's called Signal on the war relation. And it's, uh, a <clears throat> when you look at it, it looks like a, just a sort of a, a pretty textile work with a lot of red French knots and the stitching. And these are originally, uh, a different writing by a woman from different countries, Syria, Afghanistan, China, Japan. And, um, but those are the uh, writing that was under oppression. And by writing it, some people go to prison. Some people are to only whisper from year to year, not, not writing it down. So what I decided to do was I took those writings and researched them, and then translated them into Morse code. And Morse code is just a dot and slashes. And, uh, and I created, uh, again, one can just draw those dots and lines. <clears throat> instead, <clears throat> instead, I decided to use the stitches uh, on linen. And the one of the reason is that, um, during the World War II in Japan, a lot of young men going off to die for the, for the emperor, for the country. And before he takes off, all the neighboring women, mothers and sisters, they um, take a <clears throat> piece of fabric and they make 1,000 French knots all over it using a red thread. And they collectively made that into one sheet of fabric and give it to a soldier. And that becomes an amulet. So the, <clears throat> the um, young will wrap around their body uh, with this amulet. And the signal is don't die. Yet they will say that. They cannot say that. Um, so they will celebrate going off to the war but at the same time, they're holding the signal from all these women uh, stitching together amulet to say, you know, keep their life safe. So I thought that might be a, a, a good way to uh, so just to layering it and to uh, a different kind of a communication that these women are uh, creating, taking a risk of writing it. Great, thank you. And I also wanted to ask um, about the way that you engage with language, which is in a sense, the absence of the language. And I referenced earlier that you use redaction. And thank you, Professor Salas, mm -hmm. for prompting me to, to say what, what I mean with redaction. <laughs> Um, and in so, in such that your work references government government documents, um, perhaps we've we've seen in newspapers where areas of text get get blacked out, get concealed um, because it is classified or sensitive in some way. And you're using that in in your work. You're really referencing that obscuring of language, obscuring of of communication. Um, can you talk about mm -hmm. reasons for those choices and how that plays out in the work? Yeah, um, one piece that uh, literally uh, show that the redaction is that it's called the report. It's a 12 panel plaster piece that it's uh, based on the report that was a given or uh, presented by Tep electric power company there was a responsible for Fukushima Daiichi planter the nuclear plant uh, disaster and 
under the name of transparency, they presented this uh, one particular document, a 12 page document. But for the security reason, they redacted 95% of the uh, document. It's pretty much all blacked out. And I, um, I wanted to capture that, that both transparency, op so the openness, and also uh, reduction, redacting the document. And so, again, I'm thinking about what, and I thought about plaster is the um, making a mold, to make a mold and to sort of creating a sort of a um, negative space, what's, what it's not there. By pouring a plaster, it shows what's not there. But at the same time, also, at crime scene, people pour the plaster to capture the uh, footprints of the crime scene. And I thought about that, and just looking at those redacted documents, that it's almost like a you know, sole of the shoes. So at that moment, I said, okay, this piece has to be plaster piece. And that's how I created this piece. But it's also um, earlier is the detention center piece. Although those are the footprints of the uh, detention center buildings, it does have that resonance of a reduction and Although those are not the two to redact, to hide the documents, but what's ha happening in the building is very much redacted from current, you know, the public. Uh, so in that sense, there is also the echoing that idea of a reduction, what's hiding and try to sort of reveal what's being hidden. This is so interesting. You're the connection you make to plaster being used at a crime scene to to reveal things and the quality the feeling that i get when i look at these pieces which is you know really haunting i mean i, I feel like i'm aware of something but also it's so mysterious i can't quite put my finger on what i'm on what i'm looking at which is a really big contrast to the work that you have behind you in the studio. So you have another facet to your practice, which is to make um, po pro protest um, banners that are taken out into the, into the streets for, for protests and as I understand it, then, then continue to circulate. Um, and the work that we have here in the gallery is, is really different. It's, it's, certainly engaged with some of the same topics of, of injustice, historical and current conflict, but in a, in a much subtler way, in a way that demands that we look closer and read and examine. And I wonder if you could just speak about your reasons for making um, these, these two sort of seemingly divergent, aesthetically divergent bodies of work. Mm -hmm. um, I think that those banners on the on the street has its own function. That talk about nuance through banner. You really have to articulate in a very short sentences and also visually you have to communicate and you have to be able to shout as loud as possible so that the media comes to the protest they will be attracted to those images and sentences, and then that going to become a, your evening news and the local news. And that's a very important part of uh, banners for, especially, you know, around here in Ohio, the small city, um, that becomes a very important aspect of uh, any protest that I provide those loud shouting banners uh, with the language. And, um, but on gallery piece, uh, it's the opposite. It's a very quiet and it's very, uh, it's almost like a soothing sort of aesthetics. Is getting people to pay attention. Uh, it takes a slower process. At the beginning, 
I'm not putting anything in your face. It's a very inviting space. And, but when you get closer and you pay attention and then you started discovering those layers, that's when you make a connection of between pieces and between peace and yourself. And when you leave the gallery, uh, you continue to carry that connection and hopefully manifest into your, your decision in your work too. Great. Um, so surprisingly, at least to me, um, we're already a solid 20 minutes into this conversation. So I'd just like <laughs> to encourage anyone watching us live if you have a question for Mijua. Um, thank you, Professor Salas. Um, he asks, your work in the gallery focuses on absence. Most artists fill space to make a statement. We feel the need to create a thing. Your work communicates the power of absence and silence. Do you find this communication difficult to translate to an audience? Or is that potential frustration intentional? Um, you know, I think that's, that this might be a good opportunity to, to talk about the word slippage that I use for the title. Uh, that absence was slippage which is usually people tend to think of as a, a negative space, a void, or something that you want to jump over um, or go around to avoid that. Um, but over the last 15 years or so, I realized that's a valid space. And also going back to my language being abstract and being an immigrant and having that sort of a in-between space, um, this absent space is actually, it's a very important space that I kind of want to widen it and to be, make it a, a real space rather than uh, it's not absent of things, but it's the absence that it's filled with things, uh, which is also Japanese uh, spatial aesthetics. Um, empty room is not empty or absence of things it's not necessarily always empty you can that's when you can see the shadow changes throughout the day um, on the shoji screen you can see the uh, nature changing because it's uh it's empty and i think that's also part of my underlying aesthetic choice too great thank you uh, students out there or anyone else in the community watching, um, I'll give you another chance for, for questions. I'll just ask, since you talked about the, the title um, slippage, if you could also address fault lines and the meaning of that in your, in your work. Um, well, I I've used the title slippage in the past and at times different products, but particularly I felt, um, first of all, six comes from that. I have six works in the gallery, but the fault line also, when I think about the current situation, the fault line it has a lot of connotation and meaning in it. And you know, when, when the slippage happens, it's out of attention. And the ground is shifting like an earthquake. Um, we lose the balance. And what happened is we tried to regain a equilibrium. And in that process, try to regain, again, you pay attention to surroundings, what people say, what is the sort of shift of shifted the use of language around us. And by knowing and pay attention, we regain our footings. And to me, the slippage comes from that sort of idea. And uh, that doesn't mean that uh, we are balanced. In the gallery, we want to you know, stand on our two feet and try to regain the balance. And that's what that slippage and the fall line comes from. 
So it's not necessarily a bad, disastrous way, but it's, I sort of try to use that as a point of entry. Great. Um, so we've reached the end of our time. I just want to thank Mijua for generously, oops, mm -hmm. I have one question, for generously sharing so much about your work. Um, we have another question from Professor Nygaard, and he would love to know more about what other artists have informed your thinking. So artist influences. Oh, that's always very difficult. Um, there's so many that I admire and it's from, from a painter to installation artist to a political artist, you know, of course, People like Jay Holter who use a text and, you know, uh, really constantly communicating to uh, audience through her text. But it's also, I get a lot out of uh, uh, books by reading. One is because my background is also uh, literature, uh, but I, I do, uh, well, today I was just talking somebody to today. Uh, uh, Susan Stewart, who's a writer, uh, poet, her writing feeds me a lot. And also Yifu Tuan, he's a, um, um, another scholar, talk about space and time and place. Uh, so there's a lot of times, it's, again, I get a lot of uh, language for people's words. Great. We have, we have one more question that's actually related to language. Um, okay. the, Chris Hill asks, could, could you talk about how you're involved with a kind of literacy practice by sharing and teaching skills with people in the People's Banner Workshop? Uh, could you read one more time? Sure. Could you talk about how you're involved with a kind of... Could you read... Pardon? Could, Could you read you, that question one more time? Yes. Could you talk about how you're involved with a kind of literacy practice by sharing and teaching skills with people in the People's Banner Workshop? Okay, so the People's Banner Workshop is something that I was going to start, launch, launch uh, early March. And I was preparing it and then this pandemic happened. So I, I kind of put it aside because what happened is that I was going to create the ongoing, creating the space for people come and go to create their own uh, demands and their thoughts in the public. So this is really uh, not just a protest art, but it's really a public art in a different way. And also uh, creating it, but it's not like other work. This does not have ownership or byline. Uh, people create it and then becomes a uh, collective sort of a possession. And then people will come and get it and then go out the street and then come back returning it. So it becomes circulate, uh, it will circulate. And to really sort of a, uh, creating space for uh, people's um, expressing their ideas on the street. And, uh, but it's also at the same time, by space to create together, uh, it becomes a space for uh, networking and strategizing the next step. Uh, you know, this idea, I've been doing this for the last 15 years, banner making in a more, uh, quiet sort of private way and letting people use it. Um, but I was intentionally trying to uh, use this strategy this year. But actually I'm gonna do this two months, September, October, I'm gonna be doing it. And Chris, if you or anyone else is interested, Mijiwa is going to be speaking with my public art course, hopefully um, in about a month. And so um, if, you're, if you're interested in the protest banners and, and her public works, um, 
please uh, shoot me an email and I'll invite you to, to join us. Thank you again so much for this delightful conversation. Um, it was really exciting to get a chance to talk to you and, to, and we're so thrilled to have your work here um, in the gallery this month. So thank you very much. I wish we could be thank here in so person to applaud and, and yeah, celebrate. Uh, I know, but, you know, I really appreciate that uh, for the art department and the Ripon College. Uh, and as you, Molly, and also the students. And, um, you know, during the pandemics, I realized that I view it online work, but I still, we made it physically realizing the show is something that's very important. We shouldn't forget that. It's the physical showing up, either protest or art gallery. I think that's still something that we have to keep uh, shooting for, not just the, uh, using an online experience as a remedy. And we still have to demand the physical exchange of people and ideas. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, everyone. And thanks for those of you that are watching this on the recording. <laughs>